Good morning and thank you for joining me on the Path to Liberty. It's Wednesday, November, what is it, the 19th? No, the 18th, 2020. I really appreciate you being here. And on this episode, I want to spend a little time explaining a main structural difference between state constitutions and the Constitution for the United States. And it may seem kind of like a technical legal conversation, but there's a pretty important reason why I want to talk about that. And, well, there's a lot of problems. We focus most of our work and energy and efforts here on defeating federal programs because we're the Tenth Amendment Center and we're working on addressing the largest government in the history of the world. But there are a lot of problems on the state level, too. Some, most of them, in my view, are due to partnerships with the federal government. But some of them are just bad on a state level on their own. And so a lot of people reach out to us and they say, well, you know, we want to work on nullifying this particular state level regulation or restriction or prohibition or mandate or whatever it may be. And how do we take your model legislation for this federal act and apply it to the state level? Well, the structure of the state constitutions in relationship to the federal constitution is one of the few main reasons why applying one to the other really doesn't work. And I want to go through the big reason for that. And hopefully it'll make sense. I'm going to do my best on this one. It's a really uh, interesting legal conversation uh, that I hope you'll find interesting and educational. But first of all, before getting to that, my name is Michael Bolden. We broadcast live every Monday, Wednesday and Friday at 930 a.m. Pacific time from here in my home office and studio in downtown Los Angeles for the 10th Amendment Center. Our show homepage has everything you need to follow this program, all the archives, all the individual episodes. I include a bunch of links, like today I've got uh, an article by Kurt Lash, I've got quotes from James Iredell, Charles Pinckney, uh, Patrick Henry, a speech in the Virginia Ratifying Convention, and more, so I include links to all that so you can read and see the stuff in context on your own time, because I'm just scratching the surface here. You can find all the different platforms we're on, both live and uh, archive video, plus the audio-only podcast editions, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Podbean, iHeartRadio, TuneIn, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, and elsewhere. I'm so grateful for all the positive reviews that we've been getting over on Apple lately. Thank you so much. That helps us spread the word quite a bit. The show homepage where you can get all that info and more is 10thamendmentcenter.com slash path to liberty. Again, 10thamendmentcenter.com slash path to liberty. And a quick hello to everyone in the live chat while I wait for people to get notifications to join us on this stream. Bob Landry, Funky Euphemism, uh, Southern Gent, usually just read the blogs. This is my first time on the live stream. Awesome. Welcome. Welcome. Hope you enjoy it. Uh, Tim Martin, uh, Rob Wood, Patricia Dance, Tyler B. Clay Kent, Richard Kramer, Set Tooney W., Melissa Harrell, Michael Bogus, good to see you. EHP Training, always good to see you as well. W.C. Neal, Alan Mosley, Rob Wood, Dan Reed, Liberty Firearms over on Twitch. Awesome. I really appreciate you being there on the platform. Uh, Irwin, Brody, and everyone else, I apologize if I missed anybody. I see a lot of people who are members who support us financially. I can't thank you enough. I don't want to dox anybody in case you're doing that privately, but I'm so very grateful for putting your financial faith behind our work. Thank you. Let's get right to this. And I want to start out with Patrick Henry in the Virginia Ratifying Convention. He's arguing against ratification of the Constitution here without a Bill of Rights. Now, I... That was a primary concern for Henry. And here's what he's talking about. He's talking about delegated and reserved powers. He says, Mr. Chairman, the necessity of a Bill of Rights appears to me to be greater in this government than ever it was in any government before. I have observed already that the sense of the European nations, and particularly Great Britain, is against the construction of rights being retained which are not expressly relinquished. We all understand that the Constitution for the United States, as drafted and then reaffirmed through passage of the Ninth and Tenth Amendment, only has the powers that have been delegated to it and nothing more. And everything else is reserved to the states or to the people, right? And so this is what how the, the document was sold. This was how it was sold even before the Tenth Amendment, the Bill of Rights, was ever even considered. And Patrick Henry was concerned about that. He's like, okay, you're telling us this. But if we look at our experience, our history, other people aren't doing this. So this is kind of a novel approach. 
So why don't we include that language in the document itself? He says, I repeat, all nations have adopted this construction that all rights not express, expressly and unequivocally reserved to the people are impliedly and incidentally relinquished to the rulers as necess necessarily inseparable from the delegated power. So basically what Patrick Henry was pointing out was something that everyone knew at the time that countries and including the state constitutions already as well, we'll get to that in a moment. It was understood that if there was a set of delegated powers, that this was uh, a certain amount of them and anything reserved had to be explicitly reserved. Now, the Constitution for the United States was totally the other way around. So let's go a little bit back in history to get uh, a little bit more understanding of that concern. Here's from a paper by Kurt Lash in the Yale Law Journal. He says, the American Revolution transformed the English colonies into free and independent states. We know we're talking about that from the Declaration of Independence, each enjoying all the rights of an individual sovereign nation. So when they seceded from Great Britain, they didn't secede necessarily as one giant country. They were 13 free and independent states. They were all sovereign nations at the time. And then going forward to the Articles of Confederation, each state, quote, and this was in the Articles itself, retained its sovereignty, freedom, and independence, and every power, jurisdiction, and right, which was not by the Confederation expressly delegated to the United States and Congress assembled. So they included something in the Articles, and mind you, a lot of people didn't, you know, they were like, we're writing a new constitution, we maybe should only be amending it, and there was some debate over that, but as long as they were discussing the document itself, they were noticing that this glaring difference was there. In the articles, it was very clear that if something was not expressly delegated, it was reserved, it was held back. And here in the Constitution of the United States, it wasn't included, but it was being told to people that that's how it was because there was no point in enumerating these powers if everything else was not reserved. Going further, Lash writes, the charters and constitutions of the states, however, did not attempt to enumerate the innumerable, or as James Madison put it, the indefinite powers of a sovereign government, a free and independent state. Going further, Kurt writes, since the states had delegated away only a portion of their otherwise general sovereign authority, this meant, quote, the powers delegated, and this is James Madison in Federalist 45, the powers delegated by the proposed constitution to the federal government are few and defined. Those which are to remain in the state governments are numerous and indefinite. They were indefinite powers, according to James Madison, in the states. And Patrick Henry was very worried about that. But he wasn't the only one. And this was an ongoing conversation. And Kurt Lash goes further. He says, according to the Constitution adv Constitution's advocates, these are the Federalist supporters of the Constitution, the act of defining or enumerating power was more than just a strategy to promote local decision making. A document enumerating a list of powers to be transferred from one sovereign to another communicated an act of partially delegated power. They weren't saying like, you just have everything and then we're reserving this list here in a Bill of Rights. No, it was the other way around. This was new, this was a new concept. It was introduced really in the Articles of Confederation in a big way and then followed up here. The idea that they could only do those things that were listed out in the Constitution. This is what, Kurt writes, distinguished the proposed federal constitution from the existing state constitutions. The latter conferred general and undefined powers of legislative authority, while the former would convey only those powers particularly granted. And that, hopefully it'll sum up a little bit better as I read through some quotes by Iridel Pinckney and others. Kurt Lash goes on though, he says, the constitution with its strategy of enumerating specific powers was proposed in a context that included well-known state constitutions of general and undefined legislative power. And that's what Patrick Henry's great concern was again. He's like, look, if all of our experience tells us 
that governments have all these implied powers and now we have something different. Even if I agree that's different, I'm concerned that someone else is going to read this in the future just like they've read every other constitution around, that you have all kinds of implied powers unless expressly uh, and very clearly reserved. But time and time again, according to Kurt Lash, the constitution's proponents highlighted the difference between state constitutions of unenumerated general, and this was called the police power, and the proposed federal constitution's limited enumerated powers. James Wilson, who I think many could actually call the father of the constitution rather than Madison, but he was very influential. I did an episode back in October about his famous state house yard speech, and these are some quotes from that. This was October 6, 1787. He says, it will be proper to mark the leading discrimination between the state constitutions and the constitution of the United States. So this is an important part to Wilson. We have to understand the difference. He says, when the people establish the powers of legislation under their separate state governments, they invested their representatives with every right and authority which they did not in explicit terms reserve. And therefore, upon every question respecting the jurisdiction of the House of Assembly, if the frame of government is silent, the ju jurisdiction is efficient and complete. I love that they could use that type of language and it was widely understood. Most people, I'm sure you guys can process that pretty well, but a lot of people would have a hard time understanding what that means. And that's why I'm so grateful for Mike Meharry's blog that we published on this either last night or sometime this morning. He put it this way. In other words, state governments can exercise any power that is not specifically prohibited to it. If the state constitution doesn't address a particular power, the state government can exercise it. It is only limited by the express prohibitions included in the state constitution or its bill of rights. And that's the important distinction. It's totally opposite to how the federal constitution is structured. And Mike goes a little further. He says, on the other hand, the federal government can only exercise the powers specific, specifically delegated in the Constitution. And here's what James Wilson had to say. Following up, he explained how the state constitutions are structured. And then he says, in delegating federal powers, another criterion was necessarily introduced. And the congressional authority is to be collected not from tacit implication, but from the positive grant expressed in the instrument of union. Hence, it is evident that in the former case, everything which is not reserved is given, but in the latter, the reverse prevails and everything which is not given is reserved. He's just explaining again, they just finished the Philadelphia Convention and here's the God that they asked to explain the proposed document to the people. And he came out with this speech, which was probably far more influential on ratification than most of the documents that we think of today, like the Federalist Papers. The Federalist Papers were primarily for a New York audience arguing for ratification in New York State primarily, and it was published much later. But this had a great deal of influence and it was widely read uh, in the states uh, around the country. So again, he's explaining that the difference between states and federal are totally opposite. Everything which is not given is reserved and vice versa on the state level. And that's how Mike sums it up as well. He says, every power not reserved or specifically prohibited is available to state governments, but every power that is not specifically given or enumerated to the federal government is reserved to the states or to the people as the 10th Amendment eventually clarified, but it does clarify now. But there are not just James Wilson. It's not just James Wilson. We also have other people like Charles Pinckney here in South Carolina in a 1788 speech in the South Carolina House. He put it this way. The distinction which has been taken between the nature of a federal and state government appears to be conclusive. In the former, no power could be executed or assumed but such as were expressly delegated. Again, that's the federal constitution. But in the latter, the states and he's not just talking about South Carolina. He's talking about the states as a whole. They were all very well aware of the very famous state constitutions, Massachusetts, of course, uh, Virginia, Pennsylvania, and others. He says, again, in the latter, the indefinite power was given to the government, except on points that were by express compact reserved to the people. Now, a lot of people don't like this fact, 
but there was no real dispute over it. And over and over, whether it was Pinckney or Wilson or here, for example, James Iredell, a leading advocate of the Constitution in North Carolina, who was eventually appointed to the Supreme Court, the first round of Supreme Court justices by George Washington. I believe he was the third seat there. And here from Kurt Lash's article, he says, Likewise, James Iredell explained the limited nature of federal power by comparing the defined and enumerated powers of the federal government with the undefined general powers of the states. And he says, If we had formed a general legislature with undefined powers, a Bill of Rights would not only have been proper, but necessary. And it should have then operated as an exception to the legislative authority in such particulars. There was a lot of opposition to including a Bill of Rights. I should probably do an episode about that specifically, maybe for Bill of Rights Day next month on December 15th. If you're interested in that, please let me know either in the comments or feel free to email me at team at 10th Amendment Center dot com. But there was a lot of opposition to it. And one of the great pieces of opposition was this. They were like saying, like, look, the Bill of Rights is used for a different type of a constitution, different structure of government. That is to expressly reserve stuff where everything else has been delegated away, where they can just do everything else. And so this might confuse people into thinking like, oh, OK, that's how this constitution is supposed to work. So people who oppose the Bill of Rights, including a Bill of Rights, Iridell, Hamilton, Wilson, and others, they made that case, even though they weren't able to convince people that it was a good idea, and I agree with the opposition. But going further, he says, it has this effect in respect to some of the American constitutions, he's talking about the states, where the powers of legislation are general. But he's also actually implying, and I'm curious what that means, I don't actually have an answer, he's implying there by that statement that not all the state constitutions are set up that way. So maybe somebody else knows better than I do. I'm not an expert on all the individual state constitutions by any means, but that's what that implies to me. He says, but where they are, where they are powers of a particular nature and expressly defined as in the case of the constitution before us, the constitution for ratification for the United States, I think for the reasons given, a Bill of Rights is not only unnecessary, but would be absurd and dangerous. Again, it, he's just reiterating that this is the structure of how things went. And a lot of people who disagreed with him weren't disagreeing. So a lot of the anti-federalists or opponents of the Constitution or opponents of what Mr. Wilson or Mr. Iredell had to say, they weren't disagreeing with the fact that the federal government would be one of a enumerated powers only. They just wanted to hammer it home because, as Patrick Henry and others pointed out, the structure of all the other constitutions on a state level and in other countries, which they had actually looked at, sometimes modeled certain provisions after or learned from, were totally opposite. And this is what um, a Democratic Federalist, I'm not sure who the author of this was. I had maybe thought it was Tench Cox in Pennsylvania, but I don't think so. This is October 17th, 1787. This was one of the first responses after Brutus, uh, number one, in response to James Wilson's speech. And this was specifically, right off the bat, they're specifically talking about what Wilson had to say about reserved and delegated powers. And here, Democratic Federalist says, in the first place, Mr. Wilson pretends to point out a leading discrimination between the state constitutions and the Constitution of the United States. They're saying, like, look, in the one, it's reserved or delegated, and the other one, it's the other way around. And if that's the case, you know, that, you know, we're not necessarily disagreeing with that, but if this doctrine is true, and this is a quote from the paper itself, and since it is the only security that we are to have for our natural rights, it ought at least to have been clearly expressed in the plan of government. They're not necessarily disagreeing with the notion of the structure of the state and federal constitutions, they're just opposing ratification without that express declaration. Uh, and eventually the Federalists backed down, they made agreements with people like John Hancock, Samuel Adams, and others to include recommendations for amendments. Now, if they didn't follow through with an amendment like the 10th, I think there would have been some serious problems. Here again, Democratic Federalist points out the second section of the present Articles of Confederation says, quote, each state retains its sovereignty 
freedom, and independence. And every power, and this is in all caps, they weren't just doing that on email forwards in the last 10, 20 years, but all caps started a long time ago. And every power, jurisdiction, and right, which is not by this confederation expressly delegated to the United States and Congress assembled. So they just wanted to reiterate that point. But the structure, again, just like Wilson, Pinckney, and others pointed out, constitutions on the state level were structured totally opposite. It wasn't delegated and reserve power. It was the other way around. It was everything. They were authorized to have a general police power unless they were specifically prevented from doing certain things. So again, why is this important for our purposes, for our work here? Well, again, people often try to take our tried and true principles, our anti-commandeering doctrine, our nullification strategy that is built specifically in a legal aspect, in a constitutional history, to deal with the structure of the federal government, the nature of federal power. And then they try to replicate that and apply that to the state level. And it just doesn't work because it's not made the same way. And one place that I see this happen all the time, and I understand why, is defending the right to keep and bear arms. We urge people, when they want to nullify gun control, to address state and federal totally separately. Unfortunately, though, I think a lot of people just take the view that I agree with, actually. It's not really unfortunate that they take the view, it's just how it's applied. A lot of people take the view that all gun control measures are a violation of our rights. But because they think it's all a Second Amendment right or a violation of the Second Amendment, they can't grasp, no matter how many times we explain to them, Look, the way that the law works, the way that the Constitution works on a state and a federal level, if you try to use a strategy designated or designed specifically for a federal constitution of delegated and reserve powers instead of a general power state constitution and use the same legal strategy that's been upheld by the courts, for example, it's not going to be upheld on a state level. So what we often see is people including language that says all local, state, and federal acts are, we consider them null and void in this, in this locality, and therefore we're not going to participate. Well, the state courts are not going to look too kindly on that. And what really needs to happen, if you insist on going that route, what I think, well, don't go that route, because what you're going to do is you're going to cause an entire good piece of legislation to get killed or struck down or cause all kinds of legal problems. What needs to be done, if you want to deal with state and federal issues at the same time, you should do it in totally separate legislation. Because trying to get it all together in the same piece of legislation, trying to do too much makes it very convoluted, especially because the legal approach is so different, if there is a legal approach at all. Now, I've covered how to deal with the state level in other episodes, it's not easy. It's actually far more difficult than trying to deal with or nullify a federal act. So what you should do is separate into completely different pieces of legislation. If you're talking about gun control, for example, you want your nullification effort to focus only on federal gun control in one piece of legislation. And if you want to try to deal with the state level, if you've got a way to do that, you should do that separately so you don't sabotage a very easy piece of low-hanging fruit of dealing with the feds, which should be a piece of low-hanging fruit, but really this is the thing that comes in and messes it up a lot of times. Now, I hope this isn't too technical or too, <laughs> too detailed, but I hope you guys found this interesting and actually learned something from this. More important than anything, I hope you learned something. Let me take a look over at the live chat here and see if there's anything interesting that I can reply to. Rod Klinger says, uh, I was late to watch this, so I hope you'll make the final version available. Yes, absolutely. So once we finish the live stream, there's two ways that you can uh, check this out, Rod, who is over on Facebook. Either you can just go back to the post. It generally shows up live after processing, maybe 10 to 15 minutes after we're done, or all of our episodes are over at 10thamendmentcenter.com slash path to liberty. And then you can watch it on other platforms like library, lbry.tv, which is a censorship resistant, decentralized platform that really is my favorite. If you really want to avoid censorship, that's really the way to go. We're also on podcast platforms, Apple, iTunes, uh, Spotify, Stitcher, and elsewhere. Going a little further see if there's any other interesting questions. Oh, super chat from Gary Ames. That is awesome. I enjoy the content. Very grateful for that over on YouTube. 50 bucks. Thank you very much. We will definitely put that to good use in supporting the Constitution and Liberty. 
Uh, let me take a look as well. <laughs> Salt Laker says, let's pretend the government cares about the Constitution. Well, it certainly doesn't. And we don't want to pretend that. And in fact, I think that's a huge mistake. A lot of people think that all you have to do is repeat the Constitution. Every time we teach something about the Constitution, we send out an email, we uh, talk about a specific clause, we'll get an email back or a, a forward where they're for, someone is forwarding the email to all kinds of federal politicians. Hey, you guys need to learn this. Or they send it back to us. They don't take any action, but they tell us, you know, you should send this uh, to all the people in Congress or send it to my state representative. No, we're actually not trying to teach the government people, the people running the largest empire in the history of the planet, the largest, most powerful government ever. We're not trying to reach them because they're bad and they're not going to change their approach. What we're trying to do is reach millions of people with the truth so people can learn how to exercise their rights no matter what the government people want us to do or not. It looks like there is a spammer over on Twitch. We'll have to get rid of that as well. Uh, Ketsuni said, Tuni says, sadly, too many look to or think the federal government has authority over so many things that they don't. And one of the things that they want to do is make every local issue a federal problem. They look to the federal government to come and protect us from our bad state governments. Now, the state governments are terrible, but why would you want it? It's like going to like a local thug to protect you. You know, it's like going to Al Capone to protect you from one of his mafia agents. Like, it just doesn't make sense to me. And I guess maybe some people might want to go that route, but you're going to the government that causes most of the problems uh, to deal with another one that causes other problems, oftentimes funded by that bigger government in Washington, D.C. Uh, there is danger from all men. That's a quote from John Adams. I don't, I'm, I've seen that one, but if you've got a link to it, Patricia, Patricia Dance over on uh, YouTube, please post that because that's a great one. We should trust no one who can endanger the public liberty. I think that's the one. Anyways, I hope you guys found this interesting. I'll read through more of the comments a little bit later today. I read through all of them, so please continue to leave comments, whether it's here live or later on in the archive. I reply to as many as I can, and I got a lot, get a lot of great show ideas from the comments or from emails at team at 10th Amendment Center .com. You can help us spread the word and get the show out to more people by triggering the algorithm of the mainstream platforms you may happen to watch or listen on. The best way is to leave a review on Apple Podcasts or any other podcast platform you listen to. Smash a like button on YouTube or Facebook. Share the link to it. Leave some comments. Again, all of those trigger the algorithms and tell the platform to show the program to more people. Of course, if you really want to put your financial faith behind a work, please don't feel any obligation to do so. We're going to continue making this content for free. We do three shows a week on this program, live streaming videos. Hopefully we'll have some more short videos in the coming year, but we have over 10,000 blogs and articles on our website, a bunch of eBooks and on and on. We're going to continue doing that for free, but we do need some financial support from time to time to continue the work and to reach new people about the Constitution and Liberty. That starts out as little as two bucks a month. It's over at 10thamendmentcenter.com slash members. I'd be grateful for any consideration you can give. Again, I hope you enjoy this episode. I hope you learned something from it. It's a little bit more technical than some of the episodes I do, but uh, I hope it was interesting for you guys. I really appreciate you spending some time with me here today, and I'll see you next time here on the Path to Liberty.